Well, before we do that, maybe we should think about the word passable or passability. Uh, that word has the idea or the connotation of the capacity or the ability for feeling. Um, it would also include things that have to do with emotion or affection. And primarily in uh, Christian doctrine, uh, what's connected to passability is the idea of suffering. That human beings, we certainly uh, live in a fallen world and we suffer, we have emotions, we have different uh, things that we experience that uh, jade our experience in life. Uh, and, you know, life is uh, uncertain here. Many different uh, scenarios and circumstances can happen. And so we're reactionary, as it were, in our emotions. So, uh, for example, if we go down to the car lot and we buy a brand new car, we're happy in that moment and we have a, a certain emotion that we experience. But then say 15 minutes later, you're driving down the road and you crash the car into a tree. Now there's certainly a different emotion that's taking place in that moment uh, because your circumstance has changed. So that's somewhat of a passability, the ability to feel, the ability to have emotions. So if we add impassib M, the, the, the beginning of, of the word as we started out, if we speak of impassibility, that's a negation word. It negates passibility. So theologians have talked about the impassibility of God uh, in the sense that it hinges upon another attribute of God, which would be His, um, his immutability. And so when we speak of the immutability of God, we're talking about the fact that that God doesn't change. Uh, creatures, we are creatures, and so we are mutable. We're always changing. That's the difference between our being, which is derived from God's being. And so scripture speaks of the immutability of God. And so we have a bit of a dilemma or a conundrum because when you go to the scriptures, uh, what you find is that even though God is immutable, scripture also reveals things to us about the emotional side of God or the affectionate side of God. So scripture teaches us that God is love, uh, that there's joy, as it were, even in the Godhead. So the question is, how do you square that? How do you square impassibility or uh, the, the emotions of God uh, with the uh, immutability of God? How do you look at impassibility and immutability together? If you say that God has emotions, how can you say that the, how can you speak of the impassibility of God? So it's a bit of a dilemma, a bit of a conundrum. And uh, it, it's a deep thing. Uh, theologians have wrestled with that for a long time. And I think the best way for us to understand it, and the reason that theologians would say and speak of the impassibility of God is because they're protecting or they're upholding the immutability of God. So how do we square that? How do we think about it? I think the best way to think of it is to see the difference between creatures and the one who has created all creatures. So God doesn't change, we change. God, the comfort of this, of this doctrine of the impassibility of God, is that God is not moved by circumstances like we are. Nothing takes God by surprise. God isn't one moment having one emotion that is then changed by some circumstance like we are. That's certainly a mark of creatureliness that we change in our emotions given on uh, given the circumstance that's beyond that, that comes upon us so the comfort is that although we uphold the truth uh, that God has revealed himself as an emotional being his emotions are not subject to circumstance they're always in their perfection they're always in their infinitude as it were God's emotion is always the perfect emotion for the given scenario from from our perspective it's always perfect uh, and what a comforting thing to think that we have a God that does not change. Although we change, God does not. God is our rock. God is our fortress.